Hey, everybody, and welcome to the live recording of our uh, Young Screenwriters podcast. We're going to get started in a little bit. Um, we are here with a special guest today, Victoria Mayo, and you're going to get to learn all about her in a moment. Uh, but I am personally so stoked for this one. I've been talking about it a lot. Um, really? <laughs> yeah, oh, no, we sure. so excited. <laughs> yeah, we both have been. This is going to be a great one. And, you know, also, it's Friday. So that it's is Friday. Friday. <laughs> we made it, y'all. Amazing. No, well, thank you both for having me. I am so, I'm just thrilled to be talking with both of y'all and, and to talk shop because I am a nerd who loves to talk process and writing process. So I'm, I think we're going to have a good time. I think so too. I am, I am super stoked and, you know, I don't want to get into it too early, but I'm someone who's definitely struggled with like wanting to write huge original things. So I, yeah. I'm like, this is, this is neat. This is really cool. Um, yeah. Well, I'm the one who writes huge original things and then everyone passes on it. So like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool. So you got it. The IP, you know, we got, you got to get your own IP. Did you all do yeah. the eclipse stuff? No, because I, I wasn't, I'm in California, so oh, I wasn't right. really in the path of it. And also I, I, I found myself, I was like, why don't like everyone get over the eclipse? Like why? And I'm, I'm a huge astrology person too. So I'm like, why am I getting so angry about the eclipse? Cause the and eclipse. Then I remember, <laughs> true. But also I mean, this is like, I, I need to write this into a story one day. Um, my, I was dating my ex-boyfriend at the time of the last eclipse and this guy was a like certified hypochondriac and he thought he burned his eyes in the last eclipse in 2017. Like, and so I think I'm like, it was like that trauma coming back. Like it was like a whole month of him being like, I'm going blind. And we're like, you're fine. Like, uh, yeah, it was <laughs> Did he like bear eye uh, look at the eclipse? Just no there with his bare eyes. <laughs> no. <laughs> but still, he was like, I think I'm going blind. And we're like, you had glasses on. It was, it was a whole thing. So, wow. um, no, that that's my checkered pass with eclipses. Uh, but I wasn't really in the path of it. So it didn't feel like it was worth it. Yeah, that's fair. We were in partial. Yeah, we were in partial. Okay, cool. And then a lot of my like family all went on a freaking hike to Indiana to go see it. And uh, yeah, but we stayed here because we still had partial and we were pretty busy that week. But it was it was still really cool. It was like it was neat. Theo, did you I see forgot it? about it? No, I forgot about it. I look. I looked up. I looked up at the time, and I was like, "Oh, it's like four o'clock." Um, whoops! Like, right. well, was something happening? Wasn't there something that was supposed to be happening? Something was supposed to be up this day. No, Carl. My my husband kept like freaking out. He was like, "Oh my god, it got a little dark. It's now. It's now." And would like. <laughs> <laughs> but it was cloudy here too like it was like cloudy yeah. on and off raining and i was like paranoid about like accidentally looking into the sun because i was like what if i just look out the window by accident and i was like getting in my head exactly. so i was like no just go to work just like go to work do your thing it's gonna be fine and then yeah and then i totally okay. missed it totally forgot about it um but i will say that all of the stuff that has happened astrologically since after the eclipse, I feel like a rock star. Like I had so much mm. bad juju going on from the stars where I was like, I need this to end. And then it was like, never mind. The cleared it. There you what, go. Um, can I be an astro girly and ask you what, what your sign is? So I'm a Libra Scorpio cusp sun. I am an Aries rising okay. and Pisces moon. Oh, yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense because you're an Aries rising. I'm sorry. I know for most people, they're like, she's speaking in another language, but I'm a Leo son, so I feel you. I love that. I, I, I see know that I'm you. Sagittarius. That's about all I got, which is... Fire signs. Love it. That's mm -hmm. great. My writing partner is a Sagittarius. There you go. There. You I don't know anything <laughs> about it. I just know that for a while, people are like, you don't really make sense as that. And then they made me do a full star chart and they're like, oh my God, I see it now. And I was like, Okay. I, uh, <laughs> whatever you say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we've decoded me, I suppose. Cool. But I think we're ready to go ahead and hop in to this. And let's I'm super it. excited. So let's roll the music and we'll get her done. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is the Young Screenwriters Podcast. Uh, I'm Alexi, and I'm here today with Theo and a special guest, Victoria Mail. 
And we are going to be talking about something that I find super exciting, which is reverse engineering your own IP. So the essentially what this is, is, you know, say you want to, to sell a script that you've written. You've written an original script with like a huge world. You're going to have a hard time going out to Hollywood right now and selling a completely original pilot, especially if it's not like indie, tiny, cheap. Um, yeah. So a strategy that you can do that Victoria told me about that I'm so excited to talk about is basically creating your own IP and then to, to sell your script. So creating short stories and other material around your script, getting those published and then going out with your script. So very exciting. Um, and yeah, so Victoria, do you want to just like tell us about your writing journey and kind of what got you to where you are today? Yeah. Also, again, thank you to so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, yes, my name is Victoria. I'm from New Jersey. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, yeah, I, I kind of grew, I came out of the womb wanting to tell stories. Um, I was always writing growing up, but I never showed anyone my writing until like three years ago. Um, maybe four or five now, but, uh, basically I, I, you know, moved out here the summer after I graduated from, uh, out here to Los Angeles, sorry, uh, the summer after I graduated from uh, the University of North Carolina. And I started um, working in the film industry. In the first couple of years, I bounced around. I was working in development with Tobey Maguire, which as a diehard Spider-Man fan, like my life is complete. Um, I was a researcher. I was an assistant. I worked in casting. I did almost like everything. Um and then I got this amazing job in development with Ivan Reitman in the Ghostbusters franchise. And I spent five years in development um, with that team, with you know, assisting Ivan and then also being part of the development team. And it was really an interesting time. It was kind of the best of both worlds because we had, we were the co-parents of Ghostbusters with Sony uh, Entertainment. And then also we were, we had the Montecito Picture Company, which was all of our non-Ghostbusters stuff. So it's very interesting to be able to see like how it works when you're in charge of an IP and in charge of a franchise. And and then especially I was there when we were kind of rehabilitating the franchise because tragically the the Paul Feig movie with Kristen Wiig and all those amazing female comedians didn't do as well as everyone hoped and kind of seeing like, okay, what's the next path? And I just want to say, I don't think that movie bombed because um, it was all women. I think it's because it was lacking the connective tissue to the OG ones in the eighties. That's my yeah. official stance. <laughs> and then, um, but then it was also great to like work with, the development team and be reading books and scripts and listening to podcasts and reading articles to see like what what can we get or you know what going to be the next thing we make and um while i was working for ivan i got this idea while i was walking around the sony lot which used to be the mgm lot um about singing in the rain and making uh, a movie a script about Thing, the making of Singy in the Rain and the Red Scare. And it, initially I had no idea if those were those two things like went together. Really for me, they did because Gene Kelly, the star and co-director of Singing in the Rain, his wife was blacklisted as a communist. So um, I wrote this script about that, about Gene Kelly trying to make his, you know, what would become his magnum opus while his marriage is falling apart. And um, I'm very kind of shocked and thrilled to say that it, uh, was a finalist in the Nichols competition uh, this past year in 2023. And then, um, and that was, uh, I finished that script and I sent it to a manager contact a couple of years ago. And he's like, oh, I want to go out with it this weekend. And I was like, me? Really? Okay. I guess I'm a writer now. And so I, I just started, like it was, it wasn't really until a couple of years ago that I, I truly started pursuing this full force, like with a full throatedly. And um, since then, I've written a bunch of scripts. Um, I def I tell people, I joke, I can't come up with an original idea to save my life. So I tend to be an adapter. I love taking um, an I, you know, a myth or someone's life or an event from history and and kind of trying to bring it to life in a new way. Especially something really important to me is to center narrative, like to center people who usually haven't been representative represented in their own narrative so it's like that's that's something that's really close to my heart and, and gets me the most excited when I'm writing um but basically 
what, where I am today is I, you know, I, I just, I'm really proud. I just uh, got an in-house writing gig at an awesome podcast network. And, you know, it was funny though, last year, my manager and I were talking, this is pre-strike. He said, you know, I just sold a short story to Amazon. He's like, Victoria, what if you write a short story? And then I can take that out and hawk it. And I was like, cool. And um, this short story came out of me uh, about a woman who basically figures out artificial intelligence, like artificial super intelligence. She figures out machine consciousness, but no one will buy her pitch. <laughs> She's a woman. And that's a very yeah. male dominated industry. And like even more, I think it's like one of the few that are even more male dominated than our industry. And it was crazy because I read the statistic, like not even when I was doing research for this story, it was literally just, I was reading this statistic in the financial times that, I think in 2021 or 2022, only like two, 1.5 or 2.5% of like VC startup funding went to a female founded business. So I, I, right. Like what? (laughs) And then so basically this woman figures out machine consciousness. No one will buy her, like take her seriously. So she has the AI or basically makes, a body and a mind for the AI as her male co-founder and that, you know, things happen. Um, I love and it. while I, thank you. Um, and so I, I said to my manager and things were kind of starting to like preemptively wide wind down because of the strike. Cause it was kind of like, honestly, it was kind of for conclusion, like in December, 2022, I think everyone kind of knew that this was going to happen and so I, rem- I and as someone who worked in development, I thought, okay. And also someone who had been out with a couple of scripts for a while now, it's just, I, I hate it I, or because it feels like executives, especially younger executives, aren't being empowered to like stake their claim in a project and risk on something. This industry has gotten so risk averse. Mm-hmm. Uh, and while a part of me yeah. understands that, the other, I just... The other part of me is like, I'm sorry, this is the only industry where you have to take risks. You have to. It's the only way you actually make money. Um, regurgitating yeah. the same stuff like that. I think and we're all experiencing it now that that runs its course and gets old actually rather quickly. But anyway, I was I was thinking of, I had the short story. Things were starting to run, like kind of get quiet because of the strike. And I said, OK, sometimes executives need someone else to tell them something is good. So what if I try to get this short story published and then it'll be like a cosign or it'll be someone else vouching for the quality of this. And I, through much Googling, I found this amazing directory of literary magazines called chill subs, like chill, like chili subs, like the sandwich, um, chillsubs.com. And it's this amazing, very like easily searchable directory of all these different literary magazines that you could submit to. And so as I was looking for publications that would be a good fit for this short story that I wrote called An Even Greater Woman, um, I kept seeing, I found it so interesting because I was like, oh, there's a lot of horror short, like short story lit- or mm-hmm. horror literary magazines. And there's a lot of comedy literary magazines. And there's a lot of magazines like this and that. And then I said, you know what? And, so, and now because it was We were like fully in the strike at this point. I was like, I'm going to go back and write short story versions of a couple of my scripts, get them published, because now I can go out um, with my scripts and my short stories being like this. Here's the IP for this. It's based on this. That was published in these publications. And hopefully, especially as a newer emerging writer, that's something that helps you stand out and helps people, helps a, a creative executive or a junior exec. And, or even maybe a senior exec advocate for you or your manager advocate for you being like, in, and now I've been published in over four, I think, yeah, I think there's one still pending, but 14 literary magazines. And then I also this summer did the, you know, acquired IP for the first time. So, and I'm, I'm not saying like, cause it breaks my heart. I love original ideas, but I think like kind of like Alexi was saying, there's a way where you can kind of hack the system while honoring your artistry. Hmm. That's awesome. And that's so clever. It's cool the way that you kind of found this solution. 
Um, Nece- almost- necessity yeah. is the mother of invention. <laughs> frustration. It's a magic. It's amazing what you come up with when you're super frustrated. <laughs> and you already have the screenplays written, which I think is a really yeah. key component mm-hmm. because yeah. what what we experience in the book to film world um, on on kind of the literary side is that mm-hmm. a lot of the times they're like, oh, great, it's a book, but we don't want to pay someone to write the script. So mm-hmm. we've had situations where we've you know worked with the author to write the script, or I had a scenario where I wrote a script um, where mm-hmm. having both of those elements is almost necessary at this point in time because, right. like you said, everybody is so risk averse, um, and even with books like even though a book might have done fairly well, sometimes they're like, yeah, if it's not a bestseller, we're, you know, we're not super interested. And it's, it's very frustrating to think like, this could be a great film. This could be a great TV show, but the work that we have to do on the back end to get it considered is it's outrageous. It, it is outrageous. And I think it's only getting more. I hate to say, cause again, like I, I know so many great executives. I was one, I was like a junior exec for a couple of years and, and I was, I tried to think I was one of the good guys because I would just advocate for artists I was super I was super passionate about. But I would get kind of sidelong looks from my old colleagues being like, you're like so obsessed with this person. I'm like, shouldn't we be? <laughs> like, yeah. Like, I mean, I know I, I invented over enthusiasm, but like, shouldn't we be like this? This stuff is so hard. So we have to we have to be obsessed and we have to be passionate about the people we're advocating for. Cause I, I'm sure your audience knows, but trying to make a movie that's at least a five-year process i always joke the only reason you know montecito and ghost core and sony was able to do ghostbusters afterlife in like three years and it, it kind of became four because the our release date kept getting pushed because of the strike was honestly because the director well a, the director was a great director because it was jason right and then the director could turn to the producer and go yeah. and that actually helped kind of mm. expedite a lot of things <laughs> but um yeah it's 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 insane because I, I mean my writing partner and I wrote on stack and again during the strike kind of as like a fun thing we were kind of getting each other writers we wrote um a spinoff of like a 90s movie and everyone loves the premise everyone's obsessed and then we took it a really good friend of mine who um runs development for a huge English actors production company and my friend had pitched this you know my partner had pitched this idea to her she's like write it and I think she gave him the impression like write it and we will come like we will option it and then they they come back to us being like do you have the rights to the movie I'm like I'm sorry we're I'm so sorry but like that's your job <laughs> yeah. god there's wanted, this you as the writer they wanted that to be done before you build the package wow Wow. And God. it's just like, that's the thing that like blows my mind. So it's like, this is like an actual, in- instead of just like, cause I could just like spend the next hour, like banging my head against a wall, but I'm really excited to kind of break down this process. Cause it kind of helps you're kind of, you're doing the, their job for them, but in a way that doesn't cost you a ton. So yes. yeah. Yeah. It's just labor, right? It's just labor Yeah, instead of money. Um, yeah. That yeah. makes sense. But, and also I think once you, because a lot of these short or these literary magazines, they want flash fiction. And flash mm-hmm. fiction tends to be 500 to 1,000 words. And yes, that is labor. For me, that is even more labor than writing 7,000 words because uh, brevity, not a strong suit. I'm, I'm sure we can already tell the way I ramble. <laughs> but um, but once you kind of get, you know, it's a muscle, right? Like you develop the muscle and then next thing you know, you're banging out 1,000 words in your sleep. Yeah. And That's you awesome. already have to, and, and if it's a script you have already written, you already have something to go off of. So you're only, you're almost just like transposing it. So I'm curious about like the way that you approached it, especially for your older scripts. Like, mm-hmm. was there something that you found like a particular part? Like, did you find like the inciting incident was the, was the moment that you kept coming back to, or were you choosing something that didn't happen in your script to what was just related or like, how did, how did you kind of choose which moments to make? into a Mm -hmm. short story that's a great question um i think for me it was usually i like the the easiest way if we're going to go like very broad then get specific is like you pick a scene i think that's the easiest way to start is like what scene also what scene if you massage the prose enough could kind of stand on its own and i think that and be a little because I, I remember when I was like taking screenwriting classes. So like every scene is supposed to be a mini story where it has a beginning, middle, and end. And like I think we all do that, but we don't always think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was like something I was thinking about 
where I'm like, okay, what scene kind of operates, can operate on its own. And in um, the first uh, script to story I did this with was a, a script I wrote called Kader Idris, which is based on um, an actual mountain in Wales uh, that you can hike. I've done it. It's great. Um, where if you spend a night on the mountain alone, there's this legend that if you spend a night on the mountain alone, you wake up a madman, a poet or not at all. And so I wrote this horror movie, even though to me, it's a supernatural thriller um, <laughs> about this guy who has like, he is running from a problem and you think it's one thing. It turns out to be another. And basically like he's running from grief over something. And as the more he runs from the grief, the worse the monsters from Welsh mythology he become that he encounters on the mountain. And so that one felt really easy to me because, or very, not easy, but like straightforward, right? Because I'm like, all right, what monster or like kind of what sequence with which monster would bode it, would lend itself the best. And it turned out to me for that story. And then also for Sculpted, which I'll talk about in a second, um, to, it was the midpoint. Mm, that's interesting. It was something super revealed. Cause I think you realize you think in, and I don't want to give too much away spoilers, but like, basically <laughs> you could like Google my story. And you'll read it. Um, but basically it was, you think he's grieving like the end of a relationship and then you realize he's grieving a death. Mm. And so that That's was cool. like the, yeah, I think it's, yeah. When something's like revealed or with sculpted, um, sculpted was also tend was kind of the midpoint where it's uh, sculpted for me. I'm obsessed with Greek mythology. And so I wanted to do my, like my, my like Hercules or my Madeline Miller's Circe, but for me, it was doing a gender flipped, like anachronistic version of the myth of Pygmalion, which I don't know if y'all know the myth of Pygmalion. I'll give you the five second description. Man sculpts ideal version of woman, Aphrodite, in the one good day she ever had in all of Greek mythology was like, oh, I see you really love this sculpture. Like, I will bring her to life for you. And then they fall in love and allegedly live happily ever after. So I wanted to do that. And that's, we've seen that story a thousand times, like in modern pop culture. If you think of Mannequin, Weird Science, Ruby Sparks, My Fair Lady. My Fair Lady, um, yep. never, Oh my God. I, which is one of my favorite musicals of all time. Like, don't get me wrong. Um, but I was like, we've never seen it where it's the woman creating the man. Mm. So I did that. And, and technically everyone's in togas, but they're talking like we talk now. And um, one change I made is that Aphrodite, because it felt like very out of character for Aphrodite to be like, enjoy your life. Like, good. Like, wasn't I great for doing this? Because <laughs> like, Aphrodite loved to F stuff up. Like, she was here <laughs> to start shit. And so basically, the scene I chose from Sculpted is when Aphrodite confronts my main character, Pygmalia, not Pygmalion, but Pygmalia. Um, and it's like, okay, I'm going to bring your statue to life. But if you don't make him fall in love with you by the time of my festival in six weeks. Uh, you guys are both going to be turned into stone. And that weirdly felt nice. like, again, another midpoint where I'm like, okay, this kind of, can I can take it out and, and you know, add the context I need to with prose to kind of make this a freestanding thing. So, yeah. And then went, oh, the other one, sorry. And then I'll stop talking. Um, no, no, I want to know. <laughs> we all want to know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'm like, not, I'm used to, I'm used to men in the in this industry being like enough um <laughs> but uh, but uh oh and then but in the case of duchess of suffolk which is um a tutor i love it was the first script i ever wrote i originally wrote it as a feature now it's a mini series but i love it because i was like i always joke that in my uh, like intro to screenwriting college class everyone's writing about their lives or this really cool idea they have and i'm like in the corner being like the year is 1536 we're in the court of king henry the eighth like I, <laughs> bizarre. I but um that moment for that because i did a, a short story version of that script that I, i'm like so thrilled it got published in the ret in retrospect journal originally and then reprinted in this other magazine called infinity wanderers um, that one was really interesting because that was the inciting incident mm. where it's, you know, uh, uh, so far in the script, Catherine Willoughby, my main character is told like she, she gets married like heinously young, like even for the Tudor times, like heinously young to King Henry VIII's best friend. And she, she, she's going to court with him for the, for the first time where she's like, you know, leaving the countryside and going to the palace. And she's going to be in this cutthroat world of, of the royal court. And uh, she's being introduced to King Henry VIII 
and Anne Boleyn for the first time. And up until now, she's very outspoken. Um, and her mother and people around her have always been like, just don't like shush, shush now, like just be demure and quiet. And in that moment when she meets King Harry VIII, she cracks a joke um, and kind of like takes up space. And at first there's like this, and then, you know, the story in, in the scene, there's this moment where she's like, am I going to die? Uh, and then King Henry VIII starts laughing and he's like, oh my God, awesome. Like, you're interesting. <laughs> and and then it's like that really important moment for her. She's like, oh, being, like being more authentically myself is going to set me apart in ways that aren't, you know, in beneficial ways. Like the king likes me now, but then it also creates a lot of enemies for her. Uh, but that's the mini series version. In in this short story, it's like I'm nervous to meet the king. I meet the king. I buck everyone's advice. It ends up working out for me. Big sigh of relief. End of story. <laughs> so it's kind of, and but that was kind of like the inciting incident. Um, yeah. That was an example when the inciting incident tended to be the uh, the 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 excerpt that felt the best to kind of pull out and let live on its own. That's cool. So. I mean, it seems obvious in retrospect, but it's like it's really choosing a moment of like drama, right? Like it's like yeah. choosing a moment of drama. It's choosing a moment of conflict. And it seems like you're you're tending to choose a moment where there's a reveal, right? Because mm, I feel yeah, like I never even thought of it. It's sort of like with short films, I feel like, you know, it's yeah. like in, in short films, mm -hmm. it's almost like sometimes short films are like set up payoff rather than like, yeah. you know, a full on, you know. Introduce something, thing. bury yeah. it, be a story, come back. And yeah, no, it's, yeah. Very, it's a little more. I don't want to, because I think shorts are, I again, like shorts, I could never do because I'm like, I don't know how you do this. I'm it's like, hard. I want to say everything. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's a little more straightforward in that where, or yeah. e more economical. Yeah. So it's sort of like you're kind of doing the same thing, like where it's like for these little, for these short stories, you're choosing a moment of setup and payoff in yeah. your own, in your own story. Um, yeah. That's that's really cool. That's awesome. Thanks. And then something else that was really interesting, um, especially with the Kader Idris story, is and, and and just again to like, yes, you're adapting your own work, but a really fun discovery I made with that piece and that I would just want to share is sometimes the way in for the short story and prose is to take it, is to put it from another character's point of view. Mm. So it was really fun with Kader Idris. Like my, my protagonist in that, in that script is this chap named Morgan and it's about Morgan's journey through grief. But if we're just going to do the 3000 word version, it actually made sense to do the, to have the perspective be from the monster he encounters. Mm. Oh, cool. And then, so that was really fun because she's based, or the monster is based on, um, uh, if there's any money Welsh listen, listening, I thoroughly apologize. But I oh, think no. her character's name is like Maltinos or like Matilda of the Night. And she's like this like evil old hag. And I was like, I relate deeply to her. Uh, <laughs> we, like when I was writing it, I'd always joke, I'm like, I'm playing Matilda. Uh, <laughs> I'll just like, we, I'll save us so much on like the VFX prosthetics budget. I'll do the role. I just won't like put on makeup that day. And, uh, <laughs> But it was like, and it was like so fun to like reapproach the story from Matilda's perspective. And oh, like, and then again, it's like nothing is wasted. Uh, if there's anything I've learned, like, no, even though this does feel labor intensive, no work is wasted. Cause again, A, I was like thrilled that the story got published. And then also, you know, God willing, if, if I'm trying to find wood to knock on, but like, if this is made into a movie, then that's like a great little insight for an actor playing Matilda to have. So that's awesome. Um, yeah. Oh man, I had a question. I lost it. Oh, Theo, sorry. You... Cause I was like, <laughs> no, let me talk more. No, no, I, no. It was about what you said. It's about what you said. I'll find it. <laughs> I have a question I'm super interested in. I do a lot of adaptation mm -hmm. um, back mm -hmm. and forth as well on, on either side. And I'm really interested is when you started writing short fiction, what was your mm -hmm. way in to find your writer's voice in prose? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm like, I but don't know. Do you feel um, like it was an extension of the voice you'd already developed in screenwriting or did you have to work to find a different voice? I think it was just taking the tone of what I had and, and again, like transposing it to a different medium. Because I think, you know, those the the three scripts I mentioned had li like had lived in me for so long that it almost kind of it felt really easy to just like switch gears in a way or not as hard as maybe one would think. Um, 
And then I think I also like grew up, right? Like, it's usually like we write a ton of prose as kids, or, or at least I wrote a ton of prose as kids. Same. So it was just kind of getting back on that bike and remembering. And like, I joke because I, I, there's, I, I'm talking with a literary agent right now about doing Kader Idris as a novel. And so you should do it. You know what? It is so many words, but let me <laughs> tell you. So many words. I have, in the last year and a half, I have written three full length novels. You can do it. I, but also, but I think because, like, but I think the hardest thing, honestly, and I, I know this isn't fully answering your question, is you get really good when you're going from prose to script of being super economical. And it's like when you're writing a script, you're writing the blueprint. Like, you are putting in, in as little words as possible, as clearly as possible, like what all the department heads and the actors are going to need to know for when they realize this on screen. Whereas when you're writing in prose, you are the writer, the director, the actor, the costume designer, the production designer, the editor, the VFX coordinator, like you're doing it all. And so I think that, that was like the hardest thing to like shift of like, I, and, and it's, it was fun too. Cause like, you, again, you learn like, it's funny because when I was, you know, the first couple of projects I was writing with Luke, he he has such a beautiful, vivid mind. And I'm like, come back, come back. <laughs> like we can only, we, I, I love all these images, but we only have 65 pages to work with on this pilot and we got to save it for structure and all that good stuff. So I think for me, it was taking, I also think because those things are, um, the three short stories I mentioned are so rooted in the genre they operate in. So I think it was also just really leaning in to the genre, the horror, the comedy, like the rom, like the frothy rom com, and then you know the the costume drama of it all to kind of help bridge that gap or to help make the jump from script to prose. I don't that know was, if that's a real answer. But no, I, no, I think it is, and I think it's really. I think that doing both prose and screenwriting is a really valuable exercise. It was for me, um, mm -hmm. and being able to really fine tune your voice, find it quickly, especially find it in different genres. Like that's, that's the advanced thing, right? That's well, the and thing I, that's going to set it apart. Also something, and it's, it just speaks, I don't know if this is just more how I approach the process is I get the idea and I, I sit with the idea and then I think of what I really want to say with it. Yeah. And then I think of the genre that's going to serve it best. So like with Kader Idris, I wasn't like, I'm going to write a horror movie. It's like, I, I love this legend of the mountain. I think there's a great like structure there, right? Like over the course of a night, you're either going to be crazy, enlightened or dead. I'm like, cool. Um, and then as I was thinking of like, who would need to go on this journey? Um, my own experience with grief kind of entered the chat. I'm like, okay. And then what's the best way to tell the story about grief on this mountain in Wales that not even like really the Brits know about? Um, and it was like, okay, horror. Cool. I have barely watched a horror movie. So let's watch some horror movies and shows in the middle of the day. So I don't get too scared <laughs> and then write my horror. And so then when I was, when it was time to go to switch things up and tell the story from Matilda's perspective instead of Morgan's, it was, it, it the jump was so much easier. And then again, like, like sculpted the, the, the kernel of that idea is like, I hate, it's so hard I, I love the idea that women can have it all, but at this at the same time, we're not given the tools to have it all. It's like we have to work for like the relationship and the career rather than those meeting us halfway and helping to work for us. And so that was kind of like the thing I wanted to say with it. And then I was like, okay, we're gonna do like a super anachronistic period piece. I know it's gonna be so fun and like our flag means death and I dream of genie. And then so then again, when you're doing the voice and prose, you're like, okay, well, now I can just like do even more sassy comments and because I can throw in internal dialogue. And then, you know, I think also with, with Duchess of Suffolk, it was like, we are in the court of King Henry VIII and everyone talks like this. And, and there's like a certain kind of cadence to how people speak or how we've like decided people spoke back then. Cause if, if we heard, if there was a transcript, we would not, we'd be like, well, I don't know what the we could not they're saying. No, no we'd be like, <laughs> um, it's like when you watch Shakespeare, like when you, I think I get it. It's like I think reading Shakespeare is so not the move because you're like I don't know what you're saying. That's the, yeah, because you, you need the the rhythm. It, yeah, you're like yeah, and also just like also just like when you have the visual paired with the words, you're like oh okay, 
least you can somewhat follow it, or at least I don't know. I I'm not really like a classical girly, but when like I'm watching The Hollow Crown, I can follow it better than when I'm reading Henry V. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I think it's just really no. I think again that that might go back, or if you have a script that you're thinking I should try this with, I think taking that time to really discern like what the core emotional truth and theme is is going to make that jump a thousand times easier. So I remembered my question. Yay! So, <laughs> so it was kind of talk. It was it was related to the fact that you were saying that you decided to tell this story from Matilda's point of view, and yes. I remember that in the past I tried to take a script and write a novel version, and I was very mm. much doing like a one to one, and it just was mm -hmm. not working. And so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about. And honestly, Theo, you probably know some about this too. But like, yeah. So say you are starting with the script how like how loose is the like how much are you adding like what are the kinds of things that have to change as you go from a screenplay format to prose um and basically like are you using the same dialogue or are you completely just like taking the spirit and putting it into prose in my cases and I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just say what I've done in the past, and then let Theo give her a brilliant um, insight. Is usually the dialogue pretty much stays the same, mm -hmm. um, and then usually like the structure of, or just kind of like the overall of the scenes stay the same. It's just that when I write the script version of it, it you, tends to be like outlines, and then I don't know if this analogy is going to work, so come with me. Um, but then when I'm writing the short story, especially because it's so concentrated, I'm just taking one corner, like one picture from the outline, I color it all in. Like I can describe exactly how, what I think the mountain looks like right now and really go into like what Matilda looks like. And then it was so much fun to like give, like pull from the mythology and give her more backstory and like really dive into her perspective on Morgan. And then you still are seeing stuff from Morgan's point of view and you're learning why he's on the mountain and why he's grieving. But it's like nice in a novel, you can give multiple perspectives. Whereas I was always taught in a feature film, it is one perspective. Like mm -hmm. TV series, you can you can jump around a little more, but given the amount of time you have in a feature, it's like you're going narrow and deep on one person. Um, and then I guess like uh, there's probably the filmmakers who break that rule, but they're like, you know, they, they can do that. Um, I've done a thousand movies but so that's like what I usually am changing is I'm usually keeping the dialogue that's you that's usually the one thing that stays really one-to-one -one. I'm keeping the overall setting but I'm just going way I can just go way more into detail on everything and then I can add more internal monologue and inflections and like thoughts and wistful tangents um and and just like i'm describing the action i can really take my time a little more describing the action whereas it's like with i'm just thinking because like matilda chases morgan both in the script and in the um in the short story and like how can i do this in one so it's like one line of stage structure on the page whereas and in a script whereas in a short story i'm like how many different ways can i say run <laughs> we have all the time in the world we have three thousand words but like we have all the time in the world so and then but then certain things i usually if i'm thinking of like kader and sculpted there i i think if anything i would like structurally tweak the end a little like for morgan i like i morgan has this big revelation and i just i like kind of move that moment up so you still feel like the story is complete and it you see an arc mm. And then um, in Sculpted, there's a joke about uh, Aphrodite tells Pygmalion that she's not putting herself out there enough when it comes to love. And she goes, well, doesn't your son Eros just shoot us? And where it's like done. And she's like, yeah, no, not all the time. And B, like A, you, not all the time. And B, like you don't want Eros to shoot you right now. He has been going buck with those arrows. And, <laughs> and, and, and then... <laughs> And then the script and the story ends with like Aphrodite uh, making a bet with another god about how long Pygmalia and her sculpture are going to last. Um, and in the script, I had more time to like introduce the character of Hermes or do like, a, like introduce a messenger and then it's a reveal at the end of Hermes. Whereas in uh, Sculpted the Short Story, it's like we mention arrows, 
let's just use him because mm. it's not that make or breaks. And again, like I just did like kind of the midpoint. I just kind of wrote the scene in prose, the midpoint scene in prose, and then added, you know, took out the back half, took out the back half of the pilot and shoved in the little tag at the end. So it's just kind of like moving puzzle pieces around and then really like getting to like sit in those moments for longer. That makes sense. I love that. And I think that um, going from script to prose is a lot easier because you've already done the work when you're outlining your screenplay to figure out the best possible way to show all of these moments happening to your reader or your audience. Um, and with a fuller length novel, like the way I like to describe what a novel is, is that you're taking an experience, a theoretical mm -hmm. experience, and you are translating what you see, hear, feel, you know, taste, touch, whatever, in your mind. And you are trying to transcribe that experience to another person so that when they read the words, they have hopefully the exact same emotional, physical reaction. Um, and you have to really take into account, okay, what do I need to do to really show this? How in detail do I need to get into describing the room. Some 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 authors really do a lot of work to make sure that the reader sees this specific room versus if you just say, oh, they're in a room, the reader is gonna fill that in with their own projections of what a room looks like. So every book is not the same experience for every single mm -hmm. reader who reads it, which I think is a really cool way that medium works. And I think there's also this bonus um, in a novel where you get all of this room to play with thought and with time and with intangible things that you can't in screenplays. So my experience in, in doing adaptations of novels to films um, has very much been pulling out the skeleton of the story and then creating the best film version of it, right? Instead of doing the one-to-one -one translation, yeah. I find doesn't, it doesn't do justice. You could do it. You could do it that way, but I don't think it would be the best film. Um, yeah. The other, the other way is easier because you're like, okay, I've already got this like pretty dynamic thing happening. Um, though I think that if you were to go from a feature to a novel, um, I, I haven't done a full feature to a novel in that way way um i was mm -hmm. going to do what and i said you know what let's write the book first that's the smarter option here <laughs> and um so i flipped it to that because i was like oh like i have i have started is this indie sleaze no so queen of, this... indie, queen of indie sleaze is is my novel that i've adapted into a feature and that's okay. why i know i have it on submission right now with my agent um Yay. but um i have for example a screenplay called antibes which is a biopic um about a very short time of zelda fitzgerald's life when she and scott were Obsessed. on the french riviera and it's very experimental yeah. and it's very strange and i've started this process of like okay what does this look like as a novel because it's a weird script it's a really really weird screenplay mm -hmm. and um it's a lot harder because establishing all of the atmosphere that you you have more opportunities in a novel to establish things like atmosphere to really dig deep and to pull out memories and, and emotions and all of that. Um, so the screenplay in that essence becomes the outline where it's mm -hmm. like, okay, here's kind of a, a base idea of the story, but what is the best novel version of the story? And then it's really going into the character and, 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 and what that, so I think the other way is easier. Yeah. And then also your brilliant insights reminded me of two things. I, cause I did, I've spent like the past six to nine months. I can't even, like, what is time um, adapting a novel into a pilot. And it's like, so, but kind of like lessons from going the other way. I mean, we're lucky that our novel is like really good. Um, <laughs> and I think my partner and I were, we kind of made the decision. We're like first hundred pages are the pilot rest of the book is the season and we'll just fill it in from there. And, um, and we spent a lot of time on our, our Bible's like 20 pages because That's we had to be like, okay, how are we going to fill this in? And yada, yada, yada. Um, and then like, what does, and we were talking because we're in communication with the author. I'm like, do you have a sequel planned? Could you figure out season two for us? She's like, I don't. And we're like, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> but, and then she, but she was a wonderful being like, y'all go. Like, I trust y'all. We, our visions are aligned. Just like go. And, um, That's awesome. but but when you're going from like prose to prose to script, it's all about like, how can I show everything externally? Like it has to always be playable for an actor or so like something where a designer or the director can like translate it into something visible. Whereas with the script, everything, it's like, it's everything everywhere all at once. Like you can do whatever you want with it. 
a little more, there's just more flexibility between the external and the internal. Yeah, in a way, it's kind of like, you know, the novel is distilling everything. Yeah. For, for this and then, and then, yeah, and then also, Theo, I wrote the, the nickel script that I wrote, or the Singing in the Rain thing, like, I, I think there's a trap, and I love the whole Zelda idea, because I'm like, that's brilliant. So I think with biopics, especially nowadays, you have to go narrow and deep. Yeah. Because like my Gene Kelly thing is just him making Sing in the Rain. It's really, you know, the major focus is the marriage. Because I think you can write a novel all about his life, but that is that will not make a coherent two hour movie. No. <laughs> or no, everything's no, gonna feel no. rushed. It was like when I was watching Napoleon, I was like, there's no like theme. There's no like in, in my opinion, sorry, Ridley, but like there's no central emotional journey. It's just mm. like, and then Napoleon did this, and then he has to divorce Josephine, and then he did this, and then he went to Russia. We all know how that went, not well. And I'm like, you need like that very central through line where I think you also have that in a novel and a short story, but there's like more space. There's more like, yeah, there's a lot more room air. to play. Yeah, absolutely. So, in terms of like, practicality like just just mm -hmm. doing it mm -hmm. you you shared that one website it was a chill sub chill sub chill subs.com chill subs i'll send you the link cool and i will and I will, and I will post it in the chat right now chill subs.com and so what was so your actual process was it that you like go on you go you find the right magazine you figure out the requirements. Can you just like walk through like technically like how it worked to get yeah. beginning to published? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, again, it was I was looking for places that would publish a 7000 words speculative fiction piece. And I think honestly, like just go on chill subs and see what's out there. Because that might do some of the work for you. Like I had the idea to do Kader and Sculpted as as short stories because I just saw all the different types of publications out there. And I was like, oh, that would actually not be that hard and that I think I can do um and then so yeah basically uh and chill subs is really good about this and there's also a couple other site or like usually the literary magazines have their own sites and they're very clear about like what they want you to submit um along with your story and how they want it formatted um which runs the gamut I, I was like I, why am I spending so I just didn't think it would be this hard to keep track of single space versus double space versus name versus no name versus page number versus not. But um, it was that you have to write like a little cover letter, which is like really easy. It's like, hi, I'm this person. These are the other places I've been publishing, if any. And like, this is the log line for my script or know, short story. And like, bye, I love you. And, um, and then there's a couple different ways you submit some, some literary magazines want you um to email them directly. Some use these like kind of like softwares called Submittable or Duosma. I don't think I said that right. Um, and there's another one that I'm blanking on the name of. And then some, I try not to, uh, some lit mags want you to pay to submit. Some don't, some are only open and receiving submissions at a certain time of the year. So it's just kind of like, and that's why chill subs is so great. Cause it kind of tracks all of that for you. And you can filter like what is free to submit to and open now. And then that kind of helps inform things. But, uh, and then you're waiting either 24 hours to like months. <laughs> Publishing <laughs> is so slow compared to film. It's so uh, and slow. Yeah. I put, I, I, one of my best students is a literary agent. I'm like, oh my. And she's like, yeah, welcome. And I'm like, ah, but no. <laughs> and then, uh, and then submittable is nice because it'll tell you like you've, it's been submitted and then it's being read. So at least, you know, like something's happening. Um, and which is one of like the submission softwares, um, that's commonly used. And then you, you know, usually they're like, congrats, it'll be in, you know, this, this place or sorry, it's not for us. Um, are you talking about the process? That's kind of just like the nuts and yeah, bolts. No, of, like, that's exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, I'm always a fan of just like literally breaking it down step by step. Cause that's something yeah. that I always look for. It's kind of like, People talk about this like in like a, a big kind of like thematic way, but big no, picture, I want to yeah. know literally what you do, like where micro you go. versus the macro. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's awesome. Did you, so yeah. for these kinds of situations, do you ever have to like work with an editor to like incorporate their changes, or is that not not part of this process? So far, I haven't. Just for like the fiction I've submitted, mm -hmm. 
I have, it'll be interesting. I have a couple op-eds hopefully coming out um, at some point over the year with Salty Magazine, and that might be a little more hands-on going back and forth. But again, if you've, I, 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 I would say like, don't, even if you do get notes, like don't, I mean, mm-hmm. again, it's like we've all survived all the notes we've ever gotten on our screenwriting. Prose, I don't think it's going to ever be all that different. Um, so yeah, it's just, you know, it's notes are notes are notes. And it usually means, and one of the biggest things I learned in development, and I'm so happy I did have that time to see the process from the other side, um, rather than write, than just being a writer is that like notes mean people care. It's, they want to get in the sandbox with you. And that is a good thing. Cause I think, especially like us millennials, I mean, I don't want to assume about people's ages, but I'm a millennial and it's like, And I was like a very like overachieving type A student. So it's like, I want you to genuinely tell me it's perfect. (laughs) And like, that is not how we do it. (laughs) Like, and so it's like, no, but there's there's the real beauty and the excitement and like the magic comes from collaboration. So if someone has notes and thoughts, it means they engage with your piece. Cause honestly, and I, this is where I, my hand in my heart, where I'm like, if I read something, be like, congrats, so fun. No. No, thank you. Whether if I was, oh, there's something really interesting here. What if you did this here and that here and, and, and maybe tweak that? So it's just knowing that like notes are a good thing. They can't physically kill you, or at least not to my knowledge. And you'll also, ulti- usually you're ultimately better for them. So just kind of like, yes, they're a gift. Woo-ha. Is, yeah. Very much like a blessing if you, if you're, especially if you get great notes, like every time I've had an experience where, and most of the great notes actually have, um, have been in conversation, which I really enjoy being able to Mm. kind of spitball. And when it happens, you're like, Oh my God, yes. Because one, you get it. You you're on my page. You know what I'm talking about? You know, the vision, right? Like, yeah. And then if you're talking with someone who knows the vision, then it's like back and forth. All right, let's, let's make this the best. You're creating this. Yeah. This fun thing together. And then also that all being said, I got notes, me and Luke submitted, Luke's my writing partner submitted something to a, a very big actor and he came back with like very real notes and I was like well that's it I'm done like I I was like I don't want to do this anymore like I know it's so much easier said than done I was like no more <laughs> like that's it well, I'm when it's so specific it. too right yeah. like when it's yeah when it's but, actor notes or you know director notes <laughs> yeah well I think also something something also just because you you brought up something so great about notes and, and then we can I'm sorry, Alexa, I don't mean to be like, no, no, this, no, I'll this, is, super this quick. is perfect. This is exactly what we want. <laughs> Yay. It's like, I think there are two types of notes. And again, it was, that's why it is so great to like intern with a production company and, or work for even better if they pay you. Um, Cause I know not internships are paid um, and learn how to give feedback and like learn how to analyze things. Because something I realized, especially working in development for as long as I did, is there's, I've learned now that there are two types of notes. There are the notes, there are like, and it kind of helps because sometimes you can get a lot of different feedback or you send it to like four people and they have four different things that they want, like four different things or like someone's like, cut this character. And then the other person's like, more of them. And you're like, yeah, um, <laughs> so fun. I, and, and that's the thing where I've like, I've learned to get like, and it's something that I wish I could tell you exactly how to do it, but you just, I, I just think it comes from writing a bunch of stuff and getting a bunch of feedback where you get to a point now when I, when I fin when I finish a script, it's like, it's not finished. It's just at the point where I want to get paid to work on it more. You know, yes. it's like, I want yeah. there to be something real behind it. Cause notes are always, it's like, no, your script is going to be changing until like the edit is locked in the, of the movie. Um, But the way I kind of discern whether a note is quote unquote good, or if I want to take a note or not, is there's like, because for me, there's two categories. There's, I see your vision and I want to help you execute it better. And then there's the note where I like this aspect of it and I'm trying to make it my own thing. This is how I think you should make it what I think it should be. And it can be, again, like, I wish I could tell you how to tell one from the other it's kind of an instinctual thing that you just do via practice. But when I got notes from Jason Reitman on Showstopper, um, my Gene Kelly script, so I submitted Showstopper in 2022 to the nickel and didn't make the quarters. Um, and wow. but yeah. And then the next year I was finalist. I was 13 out of 5,600. And wow. um, <laughs> nuts. Oh, I was like, me? <laughs> you like me? Like, but I think 
it was interesting, but I think, and the only really thing that changed was, I guess, who read the script and then Jason's notes. Like that was, cause, and those notes were not major that Jason gave me. And, um, but I think I was so eager to take them because I could tell that he got what I was trying to do with the script. He's like, these, this is what I think you need to like elevate it a little and bump it up and, and make sure it, it He's like, because you and I are, we love this movie. We're obsessed with this movie, but not everyone who's reading the script is. So this is what I think you need to do and take the time to do. Describe the numbers, like do certain things like this. Cause that's the thing. Again, as a, as an Academy Award nominated writer director, like, I think that's what the script is missing. And I totally felt, and again, cause I, and again, privilege, I'd worked with him for a couple of years um, or for him, for his dad and him um, of like, I knew that he was being genuine and, and he had like the best interest at heart. And I, I knew that he was like advocating for this project or this project getting better rather than like, I think you should do it like this. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> Yeah. Based on that's what I think is really important is sometimes you get notes that are based on like people's reading preferences versus yeah. ba- versus like, here's what I genuinely think will make the story better. And the latter kind of notes for me are very frustrating because it's like, okay, I have a very specific vision for this. So while I totally respect you would do something different, that's not the vibe of what we're trying to do here. So when you find someone who gets the vision, especially if you're doing something weird or different, it's like, thank you. (laughs) Yeah. And then, oh, my last, but my last gut check too. I know I can't, I said, I couldn't tell you how, but one thing that helps me decide is if I can immediately think of solve, I'm like, oh yeah, cool. Done. Like, or yeah. if I immediately, it's like, oh, well, what if we change? Oh, I hear you. So what if we change that? If there's like kind of like mm-hmm. an immediate response that helps me discern whether it's a note worth like pursuing or not. Because, yeah, it's like if you're able to immediately kind of think of it in a lot of ways, good notes are like, why didn't I already do that? Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like, that was the story I was trying to tell. Why didn't I have that in there already? And it-, it just makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Or it's like, I mean, I have a writer's group, I have my writing partner and we, we share or, you know, we'll send things to one person's reps and then we'll have the, the other rep come in. And it's also, I like, and then like you learn to crave notes, like oh, guys, I am, more, y'all, I'm way too close to this. Is this working? And then, you know, and then, and it's also cultivating people you can trust and be like, yes, but not here. Or like, actually, I think if you're trying to achieve this, then that needs to change. And so you kind of learn, you kind of learn to get lazy and be like, fix it. (laughs) But like you kind of learn to like incorporate it and welcome it in your process rather than like someone is stabbing your baby. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you got to rotate through the friends so that you, uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you don't drive anybody nuts or you know oh, or, that, yeah. or that like I used to want to like have the same friend who I really trusted like read a bunch of different drafts and it's like eventually mm. they're gonna get as like you know used Strung to it out. as you are yeah like, <laughs> yeah. It's like they're not gonna and be that able does to happen it's like now I intentionally save people I really trust until near the end of how far I think I can take it so that they can read it fresh. And then I give it to one of them at a time so mm-hmm. that I can be like, if somebody gives me a note that's great and I decide to change a bunch of stuff, I want the other person I trust to read it like that's always how it's been and yeah. mm-hmm. go from there. But yeah, notes. Like you're so smart. How did you think of that? And yeah. we're like, <laughs> it's funny because this, this pilot adaptation I've been working on, everyone's like, the dialogue is so great. And I'm like, mostly the author. But thank you. Like, like I was just I, lifting. But yeah, I lifted lucky, it though. so well. <laughs> like, yeah, sometimes, was... sometimes prose dialogue is really difficult to put in to a screenplay because it 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 is different. Like you can read a scene that totally works on the page mm-hmm. in a book and then you transpose it into a screenplay and it's like, oh, this is so unnatural because people don't actually speak this way. So getting yeah. naturalistic dialogue. But I also do think that's a trend in publishing is that we are getting, you know, all of these new authors. I'm reading Ali Hazelwood right now. Gatsby. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> and her her prose and her dialogue is so phenomenal that I really think like the book I'm reading right now, I think I could adapt it like pretty much straight what what she has because she's so clever so i'm loving mm-hmm. seeing that trend on the publishing side because it makes it easier for adaptation yeah <laughs> line yeah. it up for us please yeah, yeah. it's so then i one more question i had kind of about this um about your reverse engineering the ip stuff and mm-hmm. your experience publishing short stories i'm just really curious like what is that 
have has publishing short stories um impacted your career in any ways you didn't expect like have you made it like any connections or like is basically like are you feeling more involved in the literary world or like just i'm just curious yeah. about that yeah i think again like all i really only started doing this like a year ago and i mm -hmm. i'm absolutely bowled over with the success i've had because again like in film i'm just used to everyone being like it's great but no like again mm -hmm. i'll like put my head through that wall just to change things up um and it feels great i think though i think like again my friend could only ever pitch making a dare a full-blown novel because she knows i can because she's read the short stories and mm. she's like okay she she's not like completely lost writing prose and i think it also really helps too it was, it was so funny that we're having this conversation today because i was having a conversation this morning with a good producer friend of mine um who is a freaking whiz at like turning out a proof of concept or a short or a short um we were talking i was like wait can i send you this short story it was the uh, even greater woman i was like can i send you this like do you think we could make a poc of this and because i don't want to direct i learned in my first filmmaking class in college i was like oh no <laughs> like no 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 good <laughs> like i was given so many gifts this is not one of them i love producing i love like midwifing the project but like don't ask me about camera lenses don't tell me where the camera should necessarily be like i don't want like act a lot and i used to one of them i don't want to deal with those assholes um <laughs> actors are amazing i love actors i'm usually writing for an actor in my head um but i was just kind of i was like okay okay and i was like wait no we shouldn't eat what and I sent her two things of mine being like because I think because we we've connected again because I feel like everyone in the film industry has been in this like weird everyone's been on their own dark night of the soul over the past year just with like the strikes and then the strikes ending and then the industry still hasn't come back to full clip and it kind of isolates everyone like I feel like we've all just kind of been isolated or at least in my group and um so it was really like hey this my friend is just an a genius angel and it was just kind of nice to see her again and just like get a drink and chat and catch up and commiserate and then you know I was so I was working on this pitch for, so my brain was like on low power mode and then I finally got a good like night's sleep last night I was like wait I should send cat like these two things because she's so great at shorts and like knocking something out and these are the two things that I think are in her wheelhouse the best and my all uh, that are like the easiest to make as a short because also that's the problem i have i don't know if you guys watch the um real housewives of beverly hills but i am very erica jane expensive like my <laughs> everything i write is like 50 million dollar min budget i remember with kader i'm like this is a 10 million dollar film and my friend who's a production coordinator right she's like victoria this is like 30 million dollars i'm like Shh. <laughs> Shh. so i think it's again it just like opens up it also like can be a way to help you find out because you know a lot of I think the one that always comes to mind is Whiplash. That was he made that as a short mm -hmm. originally, as a proof of concept. Again, and then it kind of circles back to the conversation or what we were talking about earlier, where it's like they want you to do their job for them, and one of the best ways you can do that is making a short, which is so it's so annoying. It shouldn't have to be like that, but unfortunately, I'm tragically it is right at least for right now hopefully that'll change once certain people retire and and the new guard of executives is finally allowed to come into their own because that's a whole nother podcast how <laughs> certain people in charge refuse to leave right now and it's like really fun and chic um but i think it's also like it was it's it's actually something now that now that i have a couple under my belt and they've been everywhere every story has been published at least twice um or you know printed in at least two places where i'm like okay now Again, now it's like, how can I make the most of that? And being like, oh, you know what? I'm not great at short story or shorts. Also, because I don't want to like direct or like produce like that. Um, but now it's like, oh, great. Now I have something to take to my friends who that is their specialty. And then hopefully, again, build even more momentum for myself. So it's, it's almost like you have a, a pitch that has like a seal of approval from other exactly. parties going exactly. in. Exactly. Exactly. That's, That's awesome. it's just it's just so because also and like I'm not trying to poop on executives because I again I was talking to my friend who works in the UK and it's not it's just you know she put it in a really interesting way because she's very much a creative um 
as well. And she was just saying, it's like, not people aren't looking for the next thing that excites them, at least right now. Cause, and it, and I don't think it's even like most, most executives are like this. It's just, unfortunately, a lot of these studios have become acquired by huge conglomerates and mm-hmm. they're now publicly traded companies. And, and I think some of these, these, people in leadership positions are putting shareholders over like the actual product first. Um, And it's, but I think it was when my friend described it this way, it kind of clicked and and like helped me develop a little compassion for the people on the other side where it's like, it's, they're not looking for something that excites them right now, as much as I think they'd want to. It's like, what's not going to get me fired. Right. You know, we're, we're in a tricky spot, like not just in our industry, but I think economically, like as a country right now. And so it's like, everyone's just it just feels like we're still in this phase of treading water so again that's why like having a short story and getting it published helps them do their job a little better yeah it's like they can't afford to miss right like yeah like they can't afford to miss either and so yeah it's like well, anything you can do yeah yeah I don't, or sorry i don't mean to cut you off but it no, makes me think of what, like i mean court jefferson go off king because like what he talked about at when he accepted his oscar for american fiction it was like what if instead of making $200 million movies, one $200 million movie, we make 10, $20 million movies. Um, or in my case, four $50 million movies. <laughs> but yeah, I think like things have gotten so bloated and inflated, which also feels so, I don't know, this is me just running about the industry. It feels so like, but also it feels like everyone's getting their budgets cut. Yeah. So it's like, how is this costing two hundred million dollars, but everyone working on it can't afford their rent? Yeah, but exactly. that's that's not. I don't know if I have the answer to that. <laughs> I think publishing. That's is why we struck for place. six months. Yeah. Like I what? think publishing is really in a similar, like in a similar place where even even authors, you can't just write a great novel anymore. People want you to have a platform, right? it's they want you to have a built-in set of readers which is really hard because as writers i don't know i mean i am not great with social media it gives me a lot of anxiety even though i know i need to be doing it and i keep thinking okay i have to schedule myself half an hour every morning to do it it's Mm -hmm. it's really hard like one of the things i'm going to be doing um shortly like i'm going to publish a novel on wattpad because i'm like okay i i don't want to i don't want to publish it as independently right now that's not i want to I want to try to develop an audience so that the editors who are now reading my novel, like my one of my other novels, can be like, oh, built an audience. Here's some money. Because the feedback that I'm getting from editors who've, who've, who've passed has been, we love it. I love the story. I love the writing. It's beautiful. It's this, that, and the other thing. And then it's just kind of like, but I just can't see it right now. Or they, it's very millennial, so they don't understand the millennial aspect of it, which to me is is wild. Um, so it's almost this thing where like we kind of have to do some work to establish something for, on our own. And it's really hard, but I think it's really important to like create something for yourself first. Yeah. I mean, and if, if like, I know, because it can sound really discouraging and then you're like, I'm just going to like, like sit under the table for the rest of my life. But if, again, like, I, I guess maybe it goes to show, like, I really only started doing this. I'm just looking at the date on my computer, like, a year ago. Mm-hmm. Wow. And look so, and look at everything that's come your way. The like, immortal words of Selena Gomez, look at her now. So, again, <laughs> I'm just saying that to be, to lighten the mood and also to be, like, even though it's hard, it's it's still achievable. And then it also, doable. it just, yeah. and also, it was just, it's so nice. Like, even though publishing does take a while, just to, like. I don't know. I feel like I was trying to go Looney Tunes over like the fact that like the scripts kept getting rejected or passed on because, you know, they're expensive propositions. Whereas like it's it also just kind of is nice for your mental health to like it doesn't cost a literary magazine as much to publish your story. So it is just kind of a nice little like. Little win. Of, yeah. Yes. Thank you. That was and validation, my, you know, validation ha- that you're doing good stuff. I always say my happiness is derived from the approval of others. And it seems nice to get a little, a little, a little, uh, a little, yes. Yes. (laughs) Exactly. And again, like, yeah, external validation. You need it. Even my agent was like, oh, like, have you looked at the spreadsheet? You know, my submission spreadsheet. And I was like, absolutely not. I'm not looking at it at all because I don't want to read it. And she was like, you should, you should read it. Um, And I did. No evil. See no evil. 
I was like, <laughs> wow, everything is so beautiful. Like even though even though what's in there are a few passes, it's the yeah. feedback is incredible. And I was like, okay, all right, I'm I'm better now. I'm not as I'm not as scared of this. It's gonna be fine. That's yeah. But also good. the eclipse, the eclipse just I'm I'm serious. Like I was in <laughs> such a sense. weird You're an Aries place. rising. It was on the right? Aries axis. <laughs> I was in this weird place of self-doubt where like I just couldn't I couldn't catch on to anything. And I was feeling mm -hmm. I was feeling awful. And everyone I was talking to, I was like, oh my God, I'm just like I'm all over the place. And then it was like and I'm like, oh my, okay, we're here, we're focused, we're going to do the thing. Yeah. That's it. So the main takeaway is know your astrological chart and plan yes. your life around it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and be careful of the eclipse because you could go blind, yeah. right? That's yes. uh... Even if you're wearing glasses, it's just, it's also a great tactic to keep all the attention on you in a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> any any Frog fights was well, oh yeah well i'm going blind <laughs> <laughs> again it's another podcast it's another live well awesome so i wanted victoria if you have anything that you want to plug or, or anything you got coming up that you want to share um yeah. yeah i mean if anyone wants to connect with me um i'm on instagram at victoria mail one and mail is spelled m-a-l-e um it's weird it's a truncated Italian uh, last name. Uh, so it's like, that's Victoria, like the Spice Girl, M-A-L-E-1, the number on Instagram, on Twitter. I am at Victoria Mail. And then my website is victoriamail.com. Um, and then I believe the podcast I'm working on will be dropping on Pocket FM soon. And it is called, oh my God, it's got the name. <laughs> it's called Murder Overboard or something like that. It's a new thing. It'll be very fun. That. It's a mystery, I'm told. It's, so we're, cool. we're making it a mystery, so that'll be super fun. So yeah, just, awesome. look for, just look that on Pocket FM for some of my podcast writing. That sounds great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm definitely inspired to give this a shot. Yes, um, I'm so happy. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Hey, we are now in the Q&A section where we can kind of go back through a little bit of the questions in the chat. Oh, I um, Sorry. And I thought I was going to wear my glasses, but it's not going to work. Okay. <laughs> and uh, also, I wanted to say that, by the way, right now we're doing a discount for writing the feature and writing the pilot. Um, so I'm going to post a link in the description to those. Um, this is live through April 15th. Um, and Box the ticket. Yep, there you go. <laughs> and um, I'm going to drop those links in the description. But let's see. I did see a comment up at the beginning asking about different mediums. So Joanne said, jumping ahead, what about published essays or song lyrics? I, or I guess just to kind of expand on that, any other thing besides short stories? Um, published essays, I think... Yeah, why not? If it's if it's an essay telling like a really interesting story, I know something that we had at Montecito was the Idea Binder, and it was we would call it it was digital, but we'd call it the Idea Binder, and it was all these cool either op eds or articles that we came across, whether they were in the New York Times or another publication or you know anywhere that we're like, oh my god, that would make a really interesting story, and you know, and and there is precedent for that too. I mm -hmm. mean. Um, Mike and Dave need wedding dates was based on an article or like a true, like a true story that just kind of like this viral anecdote that blew, blew up song lyrics. You're speaking my language. Um, <laughs> I wish I could write all I want to do. Like the only thing I do think I could direct would be like a music video where I have the song lyrics. Um, I've never heard about, like I've never adapted anything. I mean, like obviously the, like I think of like jukebox musicals, like where you pull totally from like one artist's songbook um like that I, for the beatles yeah and rocket man but those are those are also very I, it's funny my strike survival job was in music supervision and if you think scripts and our writing's litigious oh yeah <laughs> like music is but if, it, if it's your original song um and you release it on Spotify or SoundCloud, and then you know you it was based on some experience that you want to write about. I say go for it. I think it, it's just it's like that thing where 
I mean, I wrote another pilot that was technically based on a podcast I did for three years called Your Biggest Fan Girl. Like the podcast is still around. You can listen to it on all your favorite podcast providers. But that one was, it was really an, um, yeah, like it doesn't have to be a one-to-one. Sorry, going back to what Alexi was talking about earlier, where it was like po- the podcast Your Biggest Fan Girl was very much like us interviewing a bunch of amazing women um, who identified as fangirls and had all these different fandoms and engaged with their fandom in all these different ways. And um, our mission with that was showing like we are like fangirls are not Kathy Bates in misery. Thank you very much. They're like the amazing beautiful, hot, dynamic women um, who are also very intelligent and cool and creative and resourceful. Um, And then I, the pilot of Your Biggest Fangirl has kind of like the very, has a very similar thing of like, well, what makes somebody a fangirl? And usually it's coming from like a very deep place. Um, But that's like, that was a fictionalized version, kind of autobiographical about um, a girl who tricks her celebrity crush into dating her. Mm -hmm. So again, it doesn't always need to be a one-to-one, but again, if you have like the thematic or the emotional truth you want to tell, I say, why not? Like it can be based on Luke and I wrote something that was based on his life. Like just like a, this crazy experience he had. So world's your oyster. As long as an executive seeds based by on or inspired by, they can like breathe a little easier. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. And I'll say too, I feel like part of the benefit of, of getting of bait like creating your own ip to base stuff off of is like or base stuff on my yeah. history professor would hate that i said base it off of um but base it on um is that like to a degree you do want to have that third party thumbs up right mm-hmm. like like not like if you wrote a song i'm sure that that really really helps but you also want to make sure that you put it out there like Mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you are giving people an opportunity to find it and enjoy it and um you know to to get just another person to tell the producer like hey this people like this it won't be as big of a risk as you think um Mm -hmm. so just making sure that like in addition to to creating it that it's less like a bundle that you're throwing at the producer and more like you know this is a thing i did it got traction and this is based on it or mm-hmm. you know, something like that great way of breaking down the strategy and then let me see i think that oh he had a comment about shakespeare apparently they spoke a lot faster in shakespeare's times and the plays were a lot shorter that's that interesting play. <laughs> cool i did not yeah. know that <laughs> and that's really interesting well yeah no i can see that because like but also it just feels i don't know it just feels shorter except i don't know if you have ever if anyone else has had the privilege of going to see something at the globe this is like I my takeaway my other takeaway not at the globe so i remember we i was studying abroad in england in college and they're like we got you all tickets to as you like it at the globe and we're, we're like oh my god and um, they're like, and you're the groundlings, you're standing. And I was like, okay. And um, and like, cause yeah, Shakespeare is long nowadays. And I just remember I was in, I'm in London and we, it was like the first week we arrived in London too. So they're like carting us around like the whole country. Like we're going here and there and we're getting, we're adjusting and all this stuff. And like, we're probably still a little jet lagged. And then we we go to like a three and a half hour play at the Globe where we have to stand the whole time, and I was just like, I'm like I am hearing the all the world's a stage monologue at the Globe in London, and all I want to do is sit down. <laughs> so my one tip is spring for the seats at the Globe in London. There you go. The, that's important. Unless honestly. you want to work out, and then who am I to stop? I it? couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. <laughs> Even at concerts, when I'm at concerts, I I specifically buy the seats that don't have people in front of them, so that I can smart. Sit. So you can just do a yeah. strong sit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as you should. Well, cool. I think that I think that this um, yeah, I think this was super fun. I think that yeah. was basically all the the comments, the all the questions that we had right now. Um, yeah, but- I hope that means we were thorough. I think it does. That is that is my belief <laughs> because I feel like I walked away with enough to to try Good. this. So that is that is my personal parameter. So I'm like I learned something here today. So <laughs> well, thank you yeah. so much again for joining us. Um, thank you so much for having me and making this so delightful. <laughs> you were awesome. We'll have to have you back sometime. Yes, right? would love nothing more. 
Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Have a great weekend. Bye.